Diplomatic History, 1914 to 1980. The beginnings of military action in August 1914 did not mark the end of diplomatic action. Even before the chief, even between the chief opponents, diplomatic activity continued, and was aimed very largely at two goals: a, to bring new countries into the military activities, or, on the contrary, to keep them out, and b, to attempt to make peace by negotiation. Closely related to the first of these aims were negotiations concerned with the disposition of enemy territories after the fighting ceased. Back of all the diplomatic activities of the period, 1914 to 1980, was a fact which impressed itself on the belligerents relatively slowly. This was the changed character of modern warfare. With certain exceptions, the wars of the 18th and early 19th centuries had been struggles of limited resources for limited objectives. The growth of political democracy, the rise of nationalism, and the industrialization of war led to total war with total mobilization and unlimited objectives. In the 18th century, when rulers were relatively free from popular influences, they could wage wars for limited objectives and could negotiate peace on a compromise basis when these were objectives were attained or appeared unattainable. Using a mercenary army which fought for pay, they could put that army into war or out of war as seemed necessary, without vitally affecting its morale or its fighting quality. The arrival of democracy and of the mass army required that a great body of the citizens give wholehearted support for any war effort and made it impossible to wage wars for limited objectives. Such popular support could be won only in behalf of great moral goals or universal philosophic values, or at the very least for survival. At the same time, the growing industrialization and economic integration of modern society made it impossible to mobilize for war except on a very extensive basis which approached total mobilization. This mobilization could not be directed towards limited objectives. From these factors came total war, with total mobilization and unlimited objectives, including the total destruction or unconditional surrender of the enemy. Having adopted such grandiose goals and such gigantic plans, it became almost impossible to allow the continued existence of non-combatants within the belligerent countries or neutrals outside them. It became almost axiomatic that who is not with me is against me. At the same time, it became almost impossible to compromise sufficiently to obtain the much more limited goals which would permit a negotiated peace. As Charles Seymour put it, each side had promised itself a piece of victory. The very phrase negotiated peace became synonymous with treachery. Moreover, the popular basis of modern war required a high morale, which might easily be lowered if the news leaked out that the government was negotiating peace in the middle of a fighting. As a consequence of these conditions, efforts to negotiate peace during the First World War were generally very secret and very unsuccessful. The change from limited wars with limited objectives, fought with mercenary troops, to unlimited wars with, of economic attrition with unlimited objectives, fought with national armies, had far-reaching consequences. The distinction between combatants and non-combatants and between belligerents and neutrals became blurred and ultimately indistinguishable. 
international law, which had grown up in the period of limited dynastic wars, made a great deal of these distinctions. Non-combatants had extensive rights which sought to protect their ways of life as much as possible during periods of warfare. Neutrals had similar rights. In return, strict duties to remain both non-combatant and neutral rested on these outside. All these distinctions broke down in 1914 to 1915 with the result that both sides indulged in wholesale violations of existing international law. Probably on the hell. These violations were more extensive, although less widely publicized, on the part of the Entente than on the part of the Central Power. The reasons for this were that the Germans still maintained the old traditions of a professional army, and their position both as an invader and as a central power with limited manpower and economic resources made it to their advantage to maintain the distinctions between combatant and non-combatant and between belligerent and neutral. If they could have maintained the former distinction, they would have had to fight the enemy army and not the enemy civilian population. And once the former was defeated, would have had little to fear from the latter, which would have been controlled by a minimum of troops. If they could have maintained a distinction between belligerent and neutral, it would have been impossible to blockade Germany, since basic supplies could have been imported through neutral countries. It was for this reason that Schlieffen's original plans for an, for an attack on France through Holland and Belgium were changed by Moltke to an attack through Belgium alone. Neutral Holland was to remain as a channel of supply for civilian goods. This was possible because international law made a distinction between war goods, which could be declared contraband, and civilian goods, including food, which could not so be declared. Moreover, the German plans, as we have indicated, called for a short, decisive war against the enemy armed forces, and they neither expected nor desired a total economic mobilization or even a total military mobilization, since these might disrupt the existing social and political structure in Germany. For these reasons, Germany made no plans for industrial or, or economic mobilization for a long war, or for withstanding a blockade, and helped to mobilize a smaller proportion of its manpower than its immediate enemy. The failure of the Schlieffen plan showed the error of these ideas. Not only did the prospect of a long war make economic mobilization necessary. But the occupation of Belgium showed that national feeling was tending to make the distinction between combatant and non-combatant academic. When Belgian civilians shot at German soldiers, the latter took civilian hostages and practiced reprisals on civilians. These German actions were publicized throughout the world by the British propaganda machine as atrocities and violations of international law, which they were, while the Bel Belgian civilian snipers were excused as loyal patriots, although their actions were even more clearly violations of international law and as such justified severe German reaction. These atrocities were used by the British to justify their own violations of international law. As early as August 20th, 1914, they were treating food as contraband and interfering with neutral shipments of food to Europe. On November 5th, 1914, they declared the Hell Sea from Scotland to Iceland a war zone, covered it with fields of explosive floating mines, and ordered all ships going to the Baltic, Scandinavia or the Low Countries 
to go by way of the English Channel, where they are stopped, searched, and much of their cargoes seized. Even when these cargoes could not be declared contraband under existing international law. In reprisal, the Germans on February 18, 1915, declared the English Channel a war zone, announced that, announced that their submarines would sink shipping in that area, and ordered shipping for the Baltic area to use the route north of Scotland. The United States, which rejected a Scandinavian invitation to protest against the British war zone, closed with mines north of Scotland, protested violently against a German war zone closed with submarines on the narrow seas, although, as one American senator put it, the humanity of the submarine was certainly on a higher level than that of the floating mine, which could exercise neither discretion nor judgment. <clears throat> The United States accepted the British war zone and prevented its ships from using it. On the other hand, it refused to accept the German war zone and insisted that American lives and property were under American protection even when traveling on armed belligerent ships in this war zone. Moreover, the United States insisted that German submarines must obey the laws of the sea as drawn for surface vessels. These laws provided that merchant ships could be stopped by a war vessel and inspected and could be sunk if carrying contraband after the passengers and the ship's papers were put in a place of safety. A place of safety was not the ship's boat, except in sight of land or of other vessels in a calm sea. The merchant vessel so stopped obtained these rights only if it made no act of hostility against the enemy war vessel. It was, only, it, was, it was not only difficult or even impossible for German submarines to meet these conditions, it was often dangerous, since British merchant ships received instructions to attack German submarines at sight by ramming if possible. It was even dangerous for the German submarines to apply the established law of neutral vessels, for British vessels, with these aggressive orders, frequently flew neutral flags and posed as neutrals as long as possible. Nevertheless, the United States continued to insist that the Germans obey the old laws, while condoning British violations of the same laws to the extent that the distinction between war vessels and merchant ships was blurred. Accordingly, German submarines began to sink British merchant ships with little or no warning. Their attempts to justify this failure to distinguish between combatants and non-combatants on the ground that British floating mines, the British food blockade and the British instructions to merchant ships to attack submarines made no such distinction were no more successful than their efforts to show that their severity against the civilian population of Belgium was justified by civilian attacks on German troops. They were trying to carry on legal distinction remaining from an earlier period, when conditions were entirely different and their ultimate abandonment of these distinctions on the grounds that their enemies had already abandoned them merely made matters worse, because if neutrals became belligerents and non-combatants became combatants, Germany and her allies would suffer much more than Britain and her friends. In the final analysis, this is why the distinctions were destroyed, but beneath all legal questions, was to be found the ominous fact that war, by becoming total, had made both neutrality and negotiated peace almost impossible. We shall now turn our attention to this struggle over neutrality and the struggle over negotiated peace. So far as legal or diplomatic commitments went, Germany in July 1914 had the right 
to expect that Austria-Hungary, Italy, Romania and perhaps Turkey would be at her side and that her opponents would consist of Serbia, Montenegro and Fr Russia and France with England maintaining neutrality at the beginning at least. Instead, Italy and Romania fought against her, a loss which was not balanced by the accession of Bulgaria to her side. In addition, she found her opponents reinforced by England, Belgium, Greece, the United States, China, Japan, the Arabs, and 20 other allied and associate powers. The process by which the reality turned out to be so different from Germany's legitimate expectations will now take our attention. Turkey, which had been growing closer to Germany since before 1890, offered Germany an alliance on July 27, 1914, when the Sarajevo crisis was at its height. The document was signed secretly on August 1, and bound Turkey to enter into the war against Russia if Russia attacked Germany or Austria. In the meantime, Turkey deceived the Entente powers by conducting long negotiations with them regarding its attitude towards the war. On October 29th, it removed it, its mask of neutrality by attacking Russia, thus cutting her off from her western ally by the southern route. To relieve the pressure on Russia, the British made an ineffectual attack on Gallipoli at the Dardanelles, February December 19. Uh, 15. Only at the end of uh, 1916 did any real attack on Turkey begin, this time from Egypt into Mesopotamia, where Baghdad was captured in March 1917 and the way opened up the valley, as well as across Palestine to Syria. Jerusalem fell to General Allenby in December 1917 and the chief cities of Syria fell the following October, 1918. Bulgaria, still smarting from the Second Balkan War, 1913, in which it had lost territory to Romania, Serbia, Greece and Turkey, was from the outbreak of war in 1914 inclined towards Germany, and was strengthened in that inclination by the Turkish attack on Russia in October. Both sides tried to buy Bulgaria's allegiance, a process in which the Entente powers were hampered by the fact that Bulgaria's ambitions could be satisfied only at the expense of Greece, Romania or Serbia, whose support they also desired. Bulgaria wanted Thrace from the Marica River to the Vardar, including Kavala and Salamiki, which were Greek, most of Macedonia, which was Greek or Serbian, and Dobruja from Romania. The Entente Pars offered Thrace to the Vardar in November 1914 and added some of Macedonia in May 1915, compensating Serbia with an offer of Bosnia to Governor and the Dalmatian coast. Germany, on the other hand, gave Bulgaria a strip of Turkish territory along the Marica River in July 1950. Added to this a loan of, of uh, 200 million francs six weeks later. And in September 1915 accepted all Bulgaria's demands provided they were at the expense of belligerent countries. Within a month, Bulgaria entered the war by attacking Serbia, October 11, 1915. It had a considerable success, driving westward across Serbia into Albania, but exposed its left flank in this process to an attack from Entente forces which were already based on Salonika. This attack came in September 1918, and within a month, forced Bulgaria to ask for an armistice September 30th. This marked the first break in the united front of the central powers. 
When the war began in 1914, Romania remained neutral, in spite of the fact that it had joined the Triple Alliance in 1883. This adherence had been made because of the Germanic sympathies of the royal family and was so secret that only a handful of people even knew about it. The Romanian people themselves were sympathetic to France. At that time, Romania consisted of three parts, Moldavia, Wallachia and Dobrycha, and had ambitions to acquire Bessarabia from Russia and Transylvania from Hungary. It did not seem possible that Romania could get both of these, yet th that is exactly what happened, because Russia was defeated by Germany and ostracized by the Entente Paz after its revolution in 1917 while Hungary was defeated by the Entente Powers in 1980. The Romanians were strongly anti-Russian after 1878, but this feeling decreased in the course of time, while animosities against the Central Powers arose because of the Hungarian mistreatment of the Romanian minority in Transylvania. As a result, Romania remained neutral in 1914. Efforts by the Entente Powers to win her to their side were vain until after the death of King Carol in October 1914. The Romanians asked, as the price of their intervention on the Entente side, Transylvania, parts of Bukovina, and the Banat of Temeshva. 500,000 Entente troops in the Balkans, 200,000 Russian troops in Bessarabia, and equal status with the great powers at the peace conference. For this they promised to attack the central powers and not to make a separate peace. Only the heavy ha casualties suffered by the Entente powers in 1916 brought them to the point of accepting these terms. They did so in August of that year and Romania entered the war ten days later. The Central Powers at once overran the country, capturing Bucharest in December. The Romanians refused to make peace until the German advance to the Marne in the spring of 1918 convinced them that the Central Powers were going to win. Accordingly, they signed the Treaty of Bucharest with Germany, May 7, 1918, by which they gave Dobrija to Bulgaria, but obtained a claim to Bessarabia, which Germany had previously taken from Russia. Germany also obtained a 90-year lease on the Romanian oil wells.